Ooh, that we just give all the glory for it's you that deserve our highest praise. It is you that deserve, Lord, every bit of our hearts. For you, God, have taken our place on a cross. You have paid for our guilt and our shame. And for that, Lord, we are so thankful. God, I'm so thankful for this precious congregation. Myself, my family love with all of our hearts. God, may we continue to grow in you. May we continue to grow in our likeness of you. And may you be exalted in our time we have here today. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. How are we doing today? Wonderful. Wonderful. As uh, you can tell, I am not Pastor Rob. Pastor Rob is on a vacation this Sunday. And next Sunday, he'll actually be teaching at a Calvary in Northern California. So, uh, like it or not, you're stuck with me for a couple of weekends together. And we'll make it, though. It'll be okay. We'll make it, we'll make it through. We'll make it through, and then Pastor Rob will be back. And uh, anyways, this morning we're going to be in Romans chapter 11 to start today. Again, you have a Bible, open up to Romans 11. A couple of announcements though as you are doing that, just to add on to what Steve was saying. First of all, college group normally meets on Sunday nights. We are not meeting tonight for... uh, for various reasons. Next Sunday night, we're going to see Phil Wickham in concert. And so if you'd like to join us for the Phil Wickham concert, meet here at 5 o'clock next Sunday night. We'll talk about that next Sunday morning. And then a couple other activities we're doing for the rest of the month together. But our normal Sunday night meeting is on hold for right now. And then uh, last but certainly not least, next Saturday, uh, the women are getting together for the summer women's studies that are once a month. And my wife is teaching this month through the book of Nehemiah. So ladies, if you want to pick up your free booklet, which has cute little, you know, flowers and stuff. You can tell I did this, right? Actually, I did this part of it. That's what I did. I grabbed it in wrong. But anyways, ladies, there's a table in the back where you can pick up a, uh, a, a notebook. And again, it's not homework that you have to do before you come. It's just for you to study further after the Saturday study. So 9.30 next Saturday morning here at the church. Love to have you. If you want to bring some food to share, that would be great too. 9.30, there is children, children's ministry going on. So you can bring the kids as well. 9.30 next Saturday morning, ladies, as my wife's going to teach part of the book of Nehemiah together. But this morning, we are in Romans chapter 11. So if you would stand with me, if you're physically able this morning, let's read a portion of God's Word together. Romans chapter 11. We're going to look at verse 33. Romans chapter 11, the very end of chapter 11, verse 33 Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has become His counselor? Who is first given to Him and it shall be repaid to Him? For of Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To whom be the glory forever Amen. God, as we take a few minutes this morning to consider your word, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, that you would be our teacher, that Lord, no matter who gets behind this pulpit, whether it's Pastor Rob or myself or one of the many, many gifted Bible teachers we have at this church, I pray that we would hear from you, that you would speak directly into our hearts today. We thank you, we praise you, we give you the glory you so deserve. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I was walking across a bridge recently and I spied this guy who looked like he was ready to jump off. Don't jump, I said to him. And he said, why not? Nobody loves me. God loves you, I said. And you believe in God, don't you? And he said, well, yes, of course I believe in God. And I said, good, good. Me too, me too. But are you a Christian or a Jew? He said, well, I'm a Christian. I said, oh, good, good, good. Me too, me too, me too. Protestant or Catholic? Um, I'm, a, I'm a Protestant. Good, good. Me too, me too, me too. What kind of Protestant? Baptist, he said. Oh, me too, me too, me too, me too. 
Independent Baptist or Southern Baptist? Independent Baptist. Good, good. Me too, me too, me too. New Evangelical Modern Independent Baptist or Conservative Independent Baptist? Uh, Conservative Independent Baptist. Good, good. Me too, me too, me too, me too. Calvinistic Conservative Independent Baptist or Lose Your Salvation Armenian Conservative Independent Baptist? Oh, I'm a Calvinist Conservative Independent Baptist. I said good. Me too, me too, me too, me too, me too. Dispensational premillennial Calvinist conservative independent Baptist or historical premillennial conservative independent Baptist. Oh, I'm dispensational premillennial Calvinist conservative independent Baptist. I said, good. Me too, me too, me too, me too, me too. Against women in the ministry, dispensational premillennial Calvinist conservative independent Baptist or for women in the ministry, dispensational premillennial Calvinist conservative independent Baptist. Oh, I'm against women in this ministry. I said, oh, good. Me too, me too, me too. Sorry, ladies. This is a joke, by the way. Anyways. Pro Disney boycott, pro life, unashamed, fundamental against women in the ministry, dispensational, free millennial, Calvinist, conservative, independent Baptist, or anti Disney boycott, pro choice, unashamed, fundamental women against ministry, dispensational. Oh, I, I love boycotting against Din- Disney. Me too, me too, me too, me too. King James only, pro Disney, pro boycott, pro unashamed, fundamental against women in the ministry, dispensational, free millennial, Calvinist, conservative, Baptist, or modern versions, pro Disney. He said, Oh, I love the modern versions, and I shoved him off the bridge. I said, You heretic. Now, obviously, this is a fictional story. Some of you are like, wow, it's been a good vacation for you, huh? That did not really happen. That did not really happen. But I mentioned it to you because it's a great picture of the church today. We can agree on 95% of things, but if we find one thing, we're so quick to divide churches, not speak to one another, call one another, you know, call one another heretics, and, and we see this all the time. It was just a couple of weeks ago, I was speaking at a Baptist revival. Now, some of you know what that is. Some of you that have grown up in Calvary have no idea what a Baptist revival is. They schedule it where it's going to be like a special meeting, Thursday, Friday, Saturday night, into Sunday morning. It's a special time to like revive the congregation. And some of the friends of mine who, who lived in that area of Texas, they said that to their pastor, do you know anybody who would be good to uh, share at a revival? Or the pastor is asking these friends of mine. And they said, oh, Jason Duff. He, he's, he, he sweats and yells and screams. He's, he's kind of odd in the Calvary Chapel movement. But for a Baptist revival, he is perfect. So they called me and he literally told me that story that they said you're sweaty and yell a lot. So, so you're perfect for this. And I prayed about it and said, Amen, and, and committed to do this. And, and, and it was amazing. The first night was great. The Lord kind of put on my heart to talk about committing your heart to Christ and about salvation. It was a great night. But the second night, I felt led to preach on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> now listen, I'm not new to the South or to Baptist theology, so I could try to claim ignorance. But I knew what would happen when I taught on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And let me just say, it, the second night didn't go as good as the first night, and I probably won't be invited back again. Why? Because we divide over things in the church. And, and, and these kind of things really break my heart. And I think I have the Lord's heart on this too. I think it, hit, it breaks His heart too. I mean, we can argue over terms like filled with the Spirit or baptized with the Spirit. And we spend our time arguing. We missed experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We can argue over the gifts of the Spirit and yell back and forth. They're not for today. No, you, they are for today, you uninspired heretic. And we argue and miss what the Scriptures say that the greatest gift is, is love. Isn't that what Paul said? Now abide in faith, hope, and love. But these three, the greatest of these is love. Probably the greatest example of this in Christendom over the past 500 years is the debate over God's sovereignty and man's free will. The debate of whether God chooses us to be saved and that's what saves us or is it our response to the gospel that saves us? And for 500 years, the church has been arguing and literally in in a bygone era setting one another on fire because they disagree. In love, of course, because that's how you set people on fire. Always in love. But this debate has raged and on Wednesday night, we really get to ground zero of the debate. In my privilege to teach through the entire book of Romans, as Pastor Rob is doing that in-depth series in Romans 6, 7, and 8, we've come to Romans 9, 10, and 11 on our Wednesday night studies this Wednesday night. And that's really ground zero for the debate. And Wednesday night, we're going to tear apart the text, see what God's saying about the matter through the Apostle Paul and what he is not saying. And I hope you can be with us 6.30 this Wednesday night as we go through more of this text. But this weekend, I thought we would get in-depth on the main issue. 
Now friends, understand, it is a rule that when you are a guest speaker, when you're covering for someone, let's say, that's on vacation, you don't want to address controversial subjects. The rule is you tell people Jesus loves them and go on your merry way. But for three reasons, we're going to throw caution to the wind this morning and just see what happens. Number one reason, I don't consider myself a guest speaker. I don't. I'm one of the teaching pastors at this church that I was raised in and grew up in. I love this congregation with all of my heart and I'm convinced I'm one of the men that will be responsible before the Lord for the things that you were taught. I think whether this is on your radar or not this morning, it is important for you to be familiar with this biblical debate. Secondly, it's part of our Wednesday night study. I, I love the format of taking a portion of what we study on Wednesday night on our weekend services to really, what? To encourage you to participate further in our Wednesday night study. So this comes out of, the text does, the study does, out of Romans 9, 10, and 11. Thirdly and finally, because I know in the past this congregation has been hurt deeply by this debate, and it is my heart, and I know it's Pastor Rob's heart, that that would never happen again. So you know we're going to put all these notes online. We tape this study. It goes free online. You can get a free CD. I know I'm covering a lot this morning. The study won't be any longer, but there'll be a lot of information. You know how fast I talk. So take heart. The way to properly do this study is to listen up this morning. And then if you need more information, listen to it again. Get the notes online. In fact, better, come on Wednesday night as we will delve into this a little more uh, on our Wednesday night study. But we begin this morning understanding a little history. Although trained in Reformed tradition, Jacobus Arminius had a serious doubt about the doctrine of Reformed theology, this idea that God chooses us and we in no way choose Him, as taught by the followers of John Calvin. Basically, John Calvin taught his disciples this Reformed theology. They, they took it a little further. Now, Jacob Ar Arminius was a pastor of Reformed congregation in Amsterdam in 1588. But during his 15 years of ministry there, he began to question many of the conclusions of Calvinism. He left the pastorate and became a professor of theology at the University of Linden. It was in his series of lectures on election and predestination that led to a violent and tragic controversy. After his death in 1609, his followers developed the Remonstrance of 1610, which outlined the five points of Arminianism. This was a, a, a protest against the doctrine of Calvinism and was submitted to the state of Holland. In 1618, the National Synod of the Church was conveyed in Dort to examine the teachings of Arminius in light of Scripture. After 154 sessions lasting seven months, the five points of Arminianism were declared to be heretical. And the response to the five points of Arminianism was what we now know today as the five points of Calvinism. You can know what the five points of Calvinism are about by remembering the acronym TULIP. What does TULIP stand for? Well, hopefully it'll be up on the screen in front of you. The T in TULIP stands for total depravity. Calvinists will teach that man is totally deprived to the extent that he cannot respond to God. The U in TULIP stands for unconditional election. There are no conditions by which God elects man to be saved, including repentance. The L stands for limited atonement, that Jesus' atonement on the cross was not for the whole world, but for only the elect. Irresistible grace, that's what the I stands for. It's that God woos the elect with grace that cannot be resisted. And the P stands for perseverance of the saints, that all truly elected will persevere to the end. A doctrine known as once saved, always saved. So again, you know, Arminius kind of went against these kind of teachings that were in this form. And when he did, they declared his teachings to be heretical. And after the Synod of Dort, many of the disciples of Arminius, such as Hugo Gratus, were imprisoned, banished, and beaten. Arminianism was brought into prominence again by a man by the name of John Wesley, who took up some of his teachings and it affected the Methodist tradition, as well as the beliefs of most Pentecostal and charismatic churches. So the question we want to examine is, who is right? Is God sovereign to the expense of man's free will, or is man in charge and we dictate to God what is going to happen? Well, it is my belief, as well as Pastor Rob's and most Calvary Chapel pastors, that the scriptures teach both sides. Not both sides of some man-made five points exactly, but both sides that God is sovereign, totally in control, and in His sovereignty, He allows man to have a free will and holds him responsible for the decisions he makes with that free will. Now friends, I don't want to just state an opinion this morning, I want us to see it in the Scriptures. 
The scriptures tell us that God is sovereign for you note takers. God is sovereign. Man's not dictating to God what will happen. God is not sitting in heaven biting his nails like, I wonder what Jason's going to do. I don't know. I'm nervous. That's not, that's not God. He's totally in control. And we see this from the Old Testament. We see many other scriptures like it. From Isaiah 14, the Lord of hosts has sworn saying, surely as I have thought it, so it will come to pass. As I have purposed, so it shall stand. Friends, God is in control. We see it in the New Testament as well. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, it says, In Him we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will. Do you see that, precious church? Paul is saying we have been chosen, not because of our purpose, but because of His. Not because of the counsel of our will, it's because of His will. Well, Pastor Jason, now I'm kind of lean in Calvinist because... If God does what He wants and chooses us simply because of the counsel of His will, how am I free? How do I really have a free choice in the matter? Again, we must go to the Scriptures. Man is free. In the Old Testament, we see they had a choice whether to follow the Lord or not. Joshua said to the people of Israel of that day, Choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods that your fathers served that were the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, famous line, we will serve the Lord. God also spoke through the prophet Elijah. Elijah came and told the people, he said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow Him. But if it's Baal, follow Him. You see, friends, in the Old Testament, man had a choice to make to either follow God or not follow God. And the fact that they had a choice shows you that they were free. In the New Testament, it is the same. One of the most famous verses, obviously, in all of the scriptures, John 3.16, says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that what? That whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The not so well known verse 18 of that same chapter, He who believes in Him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You see, we are responsible to believe in the Lord. And whoever does can be saved, not just those whom God has chosen. Paul tells us it is our decision to serve the Lord. He says to his friend Timothy, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor, some for dishonor. Therefore, listen, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master prepared for every good work. That verse has implications to what we're going to study on Wednesday night. We'll see that Paul says in Romans 9, what if God wants to make a vessel prepared for destruction? And the extreme Calvinists will say, yeah, what if God wanted to do that? You could do nothing about it. Listen, friends, it's not the fact that God could do something that we're arguing this morning. Of course God could do whatever He wants. He's God. Hello? Of course He could do whatever He wants. The question is, what does God choose to do with His sovereignty? Does He arbitrarily choose to send some people to heaven and some to hell? Does He choose to make people vessels for destruction? Well, according to the same guy that wrote Romans 9, he says in 2 Timothy 2, it's up to us, the choices we make, of whether or not we will be a vessel for honor or for dishonor. You see, friends, we see balance in the Scriptures. That's what we see. Skip the next slide, guys, and go to first, uh, John, John 1, 12 through 13. Look at this verse. But as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in His name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You see the balance in the text? Verse 13, the second half of that verse is used all the time to show we have no free will. It's not the will of man. But right above verse 13 and verse 12, it says, As many as received Him, He gave them the right to become children of God. You see, there's a balance there. There's our responsibility and God's sovereignty. We see it in John chapter 6. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. Again, the first part of John 6, it's used all the time to show we don't have a free will. It's just predetermined. All that the Father gives will come to me. But the second half of the verse says, the one that comes, I will by no means cast out. Both are seen in the Scriptures. We see both God's will and man's will side by side in Scripture after Scripture. 
We see it in the Old Testament. God's will and man's will seen in the predicament of Joseph. You remember Joseph? He was one of 12 brothers, sons of Jacob, became the 12 tribes of Israel. And Joseph has a dream, remember? He has a dream that these, t- these 11 stalks of wheat are bowing down to his stock. He's having a dream that his brothers will worship him. <laughs> now, a little, little clue. If you've got 11 brothers and you have a dream that they're going to worship you, probably not good to share that with your brothers. Joseph shared that and they were like, what? We're going to worship you. You are out of their mind. And they were seething against Joseph. So what they do? They were going to kill him. They compromised. They dug a pit. They threw him in there. They sold him to Ishmaelites into slavery. He ends up in Egypt. You guys know the story. Uh, through lots of just God's grace and sovereignty, he becomes the, the second in command over all of Egypt. His brothers need food. They come. They realize, hey, he's still alive. They have to go tell their dad, we lied. Joseph is still alive. And the nation of... Israel comes to the nation of Egypt. But at the very end of the story, the very end of the story, Joseph's brothers are worried. Is, is he going to kill us once Jacob, our, our dad, is dead? Is he going to kill us for what we've done? And Joseph says this, famous verse, Genesis 50, 19 and 20. Joseph said, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. God was working a divine plan. God God ordained it. But Joseph's brothers freely chose to sell him into slavery and they were held accountable for that choice. We see them side by side in the New Testament, in the crucifixion of Christ. It says Him, speaking of Jesus in Acts 2.23, Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. There's God's sovereignty. You have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put to death. There's their responsibility. It was, of course, determined by God that Jesus would die for our sins. Yet it was man that took him by lawless hands of their own free will. We see God's will and man's will in the betrayal of Christ. Truly, Luke 22, 22 says, Truly the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. There's the sovereignty. But woe to that man by which he is betrayed. It was determined Judas would betray Christ, but God holds Judas responsible for his free decision. Even in the stumbling of Israel, Peter says to us in 2 Peter 2, 7 and 8, Therefore to you who believe, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. A stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they were appointed. Did you hear that last line? They were appointed. It was God's sovereign will. It would happen. But it was their disobedience to the word. Their free disobedience that caused it in the first place. Well, Pastor Jason, listen. Isn't God just inspiring people to do what He wants? So it seems like we have free will. But it's just God working behind the scenes. We're puppets and, you know, He's really just inspiring us to do things. That's, that's what the great evangelist Jonathan Edwards believed. But hold on a second. So God is inspiring people to sin against His will? Huh? God is inspiring Judas to betray Christ? God is inspiring the mob to crucify Jesus? God is inspiring Joseph's brothers to try and kill Him? God's inspiring the Jews not to believe? No way, Jose. But again, not my opinion, the Scriptures. James says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does He tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when He's drawn away by His own desires and enticed. We're tempted by our own desires, our own free will, our own nasty old man. Truly, Solomon, the wisest man, ever summed it up pretty good when he said, Truly this I have found, that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. We see this balance all through the scripture. We see it beautifully illustrated in Acts chapter 27. You remember the story? Paul is on his way to Rome. He's there in the ship and they're encountering these storms and God speaks to him. He says, you're going to make it, Paul. In fact, everybody is going to make it. They will not drown. He says so in Acts 27, 22. Not one of you will be lost, only the ship. 
But then just a few verses later, he warns them, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. Acts 27, 31. You see, both are true. God knew in advance and revealed to Paul that none would drown. But he also knew it would be through their free choice to stay on the ship that this would be accomplished. Friends, there's a balance. We go back to Tulip and we see there's a balance. Remember what Tulip is? The Calvinist teaching that number one, we are totally depraved. Are we totally depraved? Yes, of course we are. That's what Ephesians chapter 2 says, that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. That's what Romans 3.11 says, that no one seeks after God. Apart from Christ, we're dead. We don't seek after God. But what does that mean? A Calvinist will say a dead man can do nothing. And I agree with that. I can do nothing to earn my salvation, to save myself. I haven't earned it or deserved it. But does it mean we are dead in the sense that we cannot respond to the wooing of God in our hearts? I don't think so. Again, from the Scriptures, the same one, the same one who wrote Romans 9, wrote Romans 1, and he said this, For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they didn't glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish heart were darkened. Paul says, these heathens who don't know God, who are dead in their trespasses and sins, he goes, they are without excuse. Why? Oh, if you've been studying the Word with us on Wednesday nights, because in chapter 1 we saw, God gave them a witness in nature. The fact that the world is designed, our bodies and everything around us, this intricacy shows us there's got to be someone out there greater than ourselves. He's given us a witness inside us to say, you're not okay, you're not alright, you need a Savior. God has revealed these things to a world and they're without excuse because He has. Adam and Eve were dead in their sins, yet they could hear and respond to God, not just in words, but they seemed to understand what God was saying in Genesis chapter 3. You see, death in the Scriptures doesn't mean annihilated. It means we're separated from God. It certainly does. Every Calvinist would agree that in Revelation 20, at the second death, that someday if we are not saved, we're not going to be annihilated we're going to be separated from God, functional, yet separated from God. That's the state of man without Christ now. Totally depraved. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot figure things out on our own. We can respond, however, to God's initiation, to God's wooing. Yes, and we must. Unconditional election. There are no conditions by which God elects man to be saved. Are there conditions for salvation? Friends, there are no conditions for God giving salvation. Again, we don't earn it in any way. It is His gift and it is free. There are no conditions for receiving salvation, or I mean, sorry, for giving salvation, but are there conditions for receiving salvation? Yes! We see it in the Scriptures. We see Acts 16.31 where Paul says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. We're to believe. That term doesn't mean you just intellectually agree there's a God, but you cast all that you are upon Him. We're to believe. We're to confess. Romans 10.9 says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Notice if... If you confess, there are conditions for God to give salvation. No, you haven't earned it in any way. But are there conditions to receive salvation? Yes, you have to respond to what God initiates by believing and confessing, surrendering to the Lord. What about limited atonement? That Jesus atoned on the cross was not for the whole world, but only for the elect. Is Jesus' atonement limited? Well, it's certainly limited in its application. Only those who believe and confess are going to be atoned for. You see, with, without that understanding, then you would have universalism. Everybody would be saved. But everybody is not saved. Yes, it's limited in its application, but in its scope, not in any way. For we know Jesus died for the whole world. That's what it says in 1 John 2, 2. He himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but for the whole world. Jesus died for the whole world, gang. Well, then why is the whole world not saved? Because there are conditions to receive salvation. 
No conditions to give it. Conditions to receive it. Confess and believe. Irresistible grace. The I. Does God woo the elect with a grace that cannot be resisted? Hey, I agree. God's will is going to be accomplished. But can you as an individual resist what God wants to do in you? Yes. Matthew 23, 37, where Jesus says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But, but what? You were not willing. Jesus wanted to do something, but they resisted His will. You see, friends, I believe the Lord desires everybody to be saved. Isn't that what the Bible tells us? Second Peter 3, 9, He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Paul said it too, 1 Timothy 2, 4, God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. But man resists the will of God, as it says in Acts 7, 51, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always do resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. See, friends, there is a balance in the Scriptures. I obviously, you know, have leaned the study in one direction this morning because, quite honestly, the hostility is in one direction. No one seems to question whether or not God is sovereign. The question is whether or not we are truly free and responsible. And from the Scriptures, are there Scriptures that seem to indicate He, he forces His will upon us? Yes. Wednesday night, we will look at Romans 9 and try to bring the balance because it is there. You see, sometimes Calvary pastors are guilty of explaining all of God's sovereignty away on the altar of man's free will. I myself have said, have said things like, God would never force Himself upon you, for forced love is rape. I've said that many times. But you know, when I think about it with the issue of salvation, oh, I know that love has to be free in order to truly be loved. To be loved. To be real, genuine love. I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. But if my kid was running for the street and I saw cars coming in his direction, would I force my will upon my son, my daughter's? You bet I would. And it would be the most loving thing I could possibly ever do. Does God do things sovereignly? You bet He does. But you see what the extreme Calvinist would say is He chooses to save some and others He just lets go into the street. And friends, if I did that to my children, oh man, that would be cold and unloving and that's everything against everything we know about the Lord. You see, there is a balance, there is a strain. And I know we say, well, oh, that, that just there can't be. Listen, listen, I'm almost done. You've got to stay with me, though. When we say, we can't, there can't be a balance. One or the two have to be true. Either God is completely in control, or I am completely free. There is no way they can both be true. Peter says, this is the key part of the study this morning. Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 2, we are elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Friends, in my opinion, this is how I think this works out. And I think it's a little silly to say that. The church has been debating for 500 years with smarter men than ever I pretend to be, but I figured it out this morning. Not really. But, but I think this may help a little bit, if I can say it that way. I think this can help. Peter says, listen, listen, listen. Peter says we are elect. We are chosen by God according to the foreknowledge of God. Now listen carefully, listen carefully. Peter didn't say that we're chosen because of the foreknowledge of God. That would be Arminianism. That's one side of the coin. He chooses me because I chose him. No. We are not chosen because of the foreknowledge of God. Nor, nor does Peter say we are elect apart from the foreknowledge of God. That's the other side of the coin. Calvinism. That God knowing what I would do had nothing to do with the process. We are not saved because of God's foreknowledge or apart from God's foreknowledge, but according to or in conjunction with. You see, something that boggles my little puny brain, and I bet it does yours too, is God is outside of time. It's why he can speak the future in advance. It's why he can say to Daniel, Daniel, someday a guy's going to arise by the name of Cyrus and rule the Persian Empire. And critics of the Bible try to get rid of Daniel because there's no way. There's no way that anyone could name someone in advance and say they're going to rule an empire. Yeah, none of us can do that. 
but God can. Because He's outside of time. He sees the end from the beginning. He lives outside of time. We live sequentially. One week follows the next, followed by the next. We live sequentially, and listen to me, we think sequentially. What do I mean? I said to my beautiful wife over 12 years ago, would you marry me? And because I asked her, she said yes, and because I fooled her, she said yes. And we have been happily married for almost 12 years now. Glory, hallelujah. But there was a sequence. We didn't just meet each other and be like, we're married. Oh, yeah. just, I mean, there had to be an asking. There had to be one thing leading to another. We live and think sequentially. But here's, I think, the problem. We try to transfer that to God. That God lives and thinks sequentially. He does not. He's not sitting in heaven seeing what you can do so He can respond to you. He has both known what you would do freely and has chosen and elected you freely from before the foundations of the earth. Not because of what you would do and not apart from what you would do, but according and in conjunction with what He knew for sure you would do freely. You see, some people see it as a great contradiction. Charles Spurgeon, the great Calvinist, said God's sovereignty and man's free will are two parallel lines that only cross in the mind of God. And I love that quote. But it's not a contradiction. See, a contradiction would be say, God is sovereign, God is not sovereign. That's a contradiction. Man is free, man is not free. That's a contradiction. But to say that God is completely sovereign, totally in control, and yet man is free, totally free, that's not a contradiction, that's a mystery. And it's a mystery we see all throughout the scriptures to take you back to where we started. We're about to land this plane. To take you back to where we started, Romans 11. Oh, the depths of the riches of both the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. Who has known the mind of God? Who has become His counselor? Who gets to counsel God? I know we all try, don't we? Oh, Lord, let me give you the benefit of my insight. Oh, we try. God doesn't need our counsel. He is beyond our finding out. His ways are higher than our ways. When did we think we figured everything out about God? When did that happen? When did that happen? It amazes me on both sides of the debate. Calvinist, Arminius, we, we've got it totally figured out. We understand God completely. And you have to understand God completely. Really? When did we start to understand God completely? 1 Timothy 3.16 says, Great is the mystery of godliness. It's a great mystery. I mean, we accept other things by faith. What about the Trinity? How many of you got that down this morning? God is three, okay, but one. Huh? <laughs> that doesn't seem to make any sense, but we believe it. Why? It's in the Scriptures. It's in the Scriptures. How about the Incarnation? Jesus was fully God. Okay. And fully man. Huh? Make up your mind. You can't be 100% of two things. Yes, you can. <laughs> because it's in the Scriptures. See, don't run from the mystery. Some pastors and teachers and Christians want to get rid of God's sovereignty. And many more try to get rid of man's free will and responsibility. To me, both sides are important. And if I lose one, I lose something I desperately need. You see... I mean, as I go through the scriptures, there are times when I'm hit with a verse that lets me know God is sovereign. He is completely in control. And aren't there days that you and I need to trust like a Calvinist? That we need to trust that God is in control no matter what? Idiot, can I say that on a Sunday morning? Yeah, because it's true, isn't it? Somebody just comes against you and you're like, oh, this isn't going to work out. And God's like, you need to trust like a Calvinist. God is sovereign. He is in control. And you need to hear that. And there's other times I go through the Word. I read how God expects me to respond and obey. And I need that. I need at times to preach and live and believe like an Arminius. Like God is going to hold me responsible because He will. Great is the mystery of godliness. Don't run from that. Embrace that. And let it lead you to worship someone who is far higher than you or I. One who you can trust with every fiber of your being that He's got you and one you know is calling you 
to respond and obey. So this morning what I want to leave you with is simply this. What today in your life do you need to trust God like a Calvinist? Well, you are worried. God's not worried, but you're worried. You're biting your nail. Oh, it's going to work out. Oh, no. You need to hear that God is sovereign. He doesn't bow to the will of man. He's not intimidated by those that are against you. No, what did we learn on Wednesday night? If God is for us, who can be against us? Some of you today, man, you need to hear that. And you need to trust God that He is sovereign. The rest of you, some of you, maybe, maybe today you need to respond to God like an Arminianist. God's calling you to something. Whether it's to lay down a certain sin. Whether it's to give your life to Him fully and completely. We can use theology as an excuse. Oh, it'll all work out in the end. It doesn't matter that I respond to God. It doesn't matter what I do. Don't lose one side of the mystery, gang. You need to lay that sin down today. You need to respond to God like He's going to hold you accountable because He will. And maybe that is to lay down your life and say, Lord, I'm tired for this gap to be over between me and you. Lord, I want to be yours fully and completely. Father, we come before you this morning and Lord, I pray that we would take the many, many, many things that were shared and Lord, you would drive them deep into our hearts because I I think... This is such an important thing for us to consider. I would not dare share it if I didn't think it was important in your heart for your people today. And so, Lord, I pray because I know there are some, there are some in this room who their world seems like it's spinning out of control. It seems like your plans and the promises you've whispered in their hearts are never going to come to pass. And God, today I pray they would trust you like a Calvinist. That they would surrender to you that you are sovereign and you are in control. And no man or no thing is going to come against your will. God, we need to know that you are sovereign. And in the same hint, I know there are others in this room that are struggling with sin and you're calling them, lay those things down. Make this choice to follow me with all of your heart and all of your soul. And today I pray they would respond like an Armenianist. That they would say, yes, God, I give in to you. I give in to your wooing in my heart and in my life. And I pray that especially today, especially for anyone here today that maybe has never committed their heart to you. Or maybe, Lord, maybe it was so long ago and they've done their own thing and gone their own way and the reality is Lord now they know there's just this gulf between them and you God you died to bridge that gulf you died to take away our sin and I pray that they would respond to your wooing in their heart right now and they would surrender their hearts that they would confess and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved and friend if that's you in the quietness of your own heart right now you need to respond to God today you need to say to him Lord I believe in you and I confess I'm a sinner I confess there's a great gulf between me and you and I'm so tired I want that gulf to be gone. I want to experience intimacy with you. I want to know what it's like to be a true child of God. So Lord, I know I didn't earn it or deserve it. I know I can't somehow win my salvation. God, you have paid it all. But I respond to you, Lord, and say, save me. I give my heart and life to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. I know that was a lot. But again, that's why the notes are online. That's why we tape these. You can go listen to it three or four more times. Put me down at half speed. You know, Chuck, they put it double speed. Me is the slower button. Just, and now... 
I wanted to get through this because next week we're going to get into Romans chapter 12. And if some of you are like, I miss the old Jason with the jokes and the, the crying. Hey, ne- oh, I've already done next, next Sunday. Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. I hope you can be here. We're going to do all of that together. But this morning, I believe this is the word of the Lord for our congregation. I really do. And I don't apologize for it in any way. Some of you today need to trust like God is sovereign because He is. And some of you need to respond like you're responsible because you are. How that works out? Ah, it's a great mystery. But it's true. There are men and women up front that would love to pray with you for whatever's going on in your heart and life today. Especially, especially if you gave your life to the Lord today. We don't want to just lead you in some religious prayer. We want to help you walk with God. So whether you're sick, whether things are trouble at home, or whether you submitted your heart to the Lord, these men and women are available just to put a hand on your shoulder and pray for you. May God richly bless you as you walk with Him this week. Hope to see you on Wednesday night as we look at Romans 9, 10, and 11 together and look at some more mystery. Hopefully it'll be a good time together. Let's worship our King.